Well, good evening. I'm Gleaves Whitney, the moderator of this evening's debate, and I'm the director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. And I want to welcome you, a warm welcome to you and also to viewers of our webcast live. Tonight's event has caused a stir because it brings together two eminent writers who happen to be brothers. Some people would have you think the only thing Peter and Christopher Hitchens share is DNA. But anybody who has read their work knows they share much more than that. Both are independent thinkers, both are fierce debaters, and both are superb writers who show a profound respect for the English language. Christopher Hitchens, the older of the two, is one of the most controversial voices in Anglo-American journalism. Based in Washington, D.C., he has written 20 books, including biographies of Thomas Paine, George Orwell, and Thomas Jefferson, with whom he shares an April 13th birthday. So, early happy birthday. As well as scathing critiques of Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, and Mother Teresa. <laughs> Most recently, he wrote the book on atheism, God is Not Great, and edited The Portable Atheist. A contributing editor to Vanity Fair, he also writes regularly for a number of high-toned publications. Peter Hitchens, the younger of the two by two and a half years, has crossed the pond to be with us. He is one of Britain's most independent journalists who blogs and writes a regular column for the Mail on Sunday. Formerly a longtime writer for the Daily Express, Peter was once asked by former Prime Minister Tony Blair to, quote, sit down and stop being bad. This after aggressive questioning at a press conference. Peter is the author of The Abolition of Britain and The Abolition of Liberty. He has also written for The Spectator, The Guardian, and New Statesman. And it's worth noting that Peter is no stranger to our shores. He lived in Bethesda, Maryland for two years. Well, this event is unique. Christopher and Peter have never before debated one-on-one -on -one in the United States. I guess it's also unique because Christopher is in a church. <laughs> Both brothers agreed to the topics and the format beforehand. They will debate Iraq and God principally, but this evening's format also allows considerable time at the end for you to jump in and put questions to both of our distinguished guests. The coin toss earlier this evening determined that Peter will speak first on the topic of Iraq. The brothers will debate the proposition, the invasion of Iraq was wrong. Peter, you have 10 minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, that's right then. And good evening, or assalamu alaikum, as they say in Detroit. <laughs> now, in Britain, as you know, we take the adversarial principle rather further than you do. We don't just have adversarial courtrooms, we have an adversarial parliament and an adversarial press, and we have adversarial families. <laughs> and I know I'm going to be asked all kinds of foolish questions about whether we got on and what our childhood was like. I would say that it had its ups and downs. My father at one point forced us in a scenario similar to that at uh, Dayton, Ohio, to sign a peace treaty, uh, which I later repudiated by breaking the frame open and tearing it to shreds. And we would spend long summers drenching each other with uh, what was available to hand in those days before the super soaker, which was uh, used washing up liquid bottles. And since then, we've really kept our hands off each other, more or less. Tonight, those of you who are hoping for a session of mud wrestling will, I hope, be disappointed. But I, I can offer you one small thrill, which is that it seems to me, uh, and it seems to me the closer I've got to this evening, that I don't ever want to do this again. <laughs> So there is a very strong chance that this will be the last time we shall ever do this. <laughs> Turning to the subject under discussion, 
uh, the war in Iraq. I don't want to make this too easy for myself because it seems to me that it is actually a fantastically easy position to take. First of all, I'll confess that at the beginning, for some time, my mind was not made up. I considered supporting it and almost everything in my past made me want to do so. One of the reasons that I didn't was the rank stupidity of much of the propaganda in its favor. And I was particularly struck by an article by Michael Kinsley in which he said that the people who want this war are treating their own arguments with contempt. But one of the reasons that I would have and would have expected myself to support it is that, and this is bound to come up in the first half as well as the second half, the religion that I grew up with in England was not what you might think. The Christianity of England by that time was a pallid, anemic thing. The thing that we were all brought up to believe in was in something called, we won the war. <laughs> its saints were the pilots of the Battle of Britain. Its God was Winston Churchill. And it suffused everything we did. We lived, you must remember, in this wonderful, peaceful country, largely untouched by foreign attack, in a land honorably battered by war. I was surrounded. The, the cities that we lived in or near, my father was a naval officer, our father, I should say, on this evening. Uh, we lived in cities battered by war, or near cities battered by war, and everything, even as small children that we talked about, was overshadowed by that war, and we thought that it had been good. In fact, we were convinced it had been good, and we grew up entirely believing that you could, by launching war, do good things. As time has passed, and as I have traveled to the nastier places of the world, I've become less sure of this. And I've seen more and more the consequences of those pictures, which we so often see on our television screens, of the missile being launched from the ship, of what happens at the other end. And I've seen also, on a particular and terrifying occasion in Somalia, the arrival of the US Marines intent on rescuing a country in desperate, desperate straits, and the subsequent failure despite the enormous good intentions of everybody involved. But there was something else about the Iraq war that I didn't like, and that was this, and it was particularly just as it began, and as I was beginning to feel most strongly that I didn't like it, uh, a rear admiral of the United States Navy, and of course I feel rather strongly about navies because of my parentage, was portrayed on the television addressing his ship's company. This was not a stirring or poetic oration. It concluded with the words, it's hammer time, and this was succeeded by a playing of a song called, We Will Rock You. <laughs> well, yes, it is quite funny, except that what they then did was to launch missiles which headed towards a country where they would land, inevitably in some cases, on places where entirely innocent people were living. I didn't think this was a serious attitude towards war. I was reminded continuously, and I have to say, I have a largely conservative audience in Britain, and I said repeatedly that I, I didn't like this war, and I would get angry emails, phone calls and letters, saying that I was unpatriotic and wrong. And I would send back one thing to most of these people, which was Kipling's recessional. And Admiral Keating's outburst made me think most strongly of that, uh, that particular passage, we lose wild, ah, I should have written this down, remembered it, I, I remembered it earlier on, drunk with sight of power, we lose wild tongues that have not thee in awe, and of the reeking tube, an iron shard upon which the heathen rely. And I thought there was an arrogance about this war, and a belief flowing from self-righteousness and misdirected idealism, which was bound to end in disaster. And I thought of my own country at the end of the 19th century embarking on the Boer War and ending, essentially, its imperial power by its overweening folly. And I thought, not merely wrong, but a mistake. And nothing, 
absolutely nothing which has happened since, and I have been to Iraq twice since that war took place, has convinced me in any way that I was wrong. This was an idealist war. It was an idealist war supported by idealists for the best of reasons. And it fulfilled my belief that there is nothing in this world more terrifying than somebody who thinks he is right. Thank you, Peter. Christopher, you have 10 minutes. And I'll take all uh, nine and a half of them. Um, it goes, by the way, if drunk with sight of power, we loose, L-O-O-S-E, wild tongues that have not thee in all, such boastings as the Gentiles use, and lesser breeds without the law. Uh, the, the, it's the whole magnificence of Kipling that is exactly what makes people nervous about quoting him correctly. Because when you get it right, it's unsettling. And lots of things about this are unsettling, and so they should be. And it's uh, my duty, as well as my pleasure, to congratulate Peter on, on keeping things edgy for this evening. You didn't come here, we hope, for a banal debate, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now listen. Uh, you can't see underneath my shirt the garlic uh, necklace. <laughs> and you have no idea that I'm fighting my way by Northwest Airlines back from here tomorrow morning to be in New York for the uh, memorial service for William F. Buckley at St. Patrick's Cathedral. In other words, you've got no idea what I've been going through lately, and there's no real reason why you should. Uh, but when they said to me this evening, when you come out, do you want to be at the throne or at the pulpit? <laughs> I did feel slightly uh, discombobulated. <laughs> and when I said, well, where's the men's room? And they said, it's down there. And there's men's room, and then there's women's room. I understand that bit. And in between, Sexton's room. <laughs> I began to feel more discombobulated still. <laughs> um, and today is the anniversary of the day in 1945 when my mother and my father got married after both of them having been through a very long war very long brutal cruel war after that succeeded the long austerity poverty struggle with which they'd had to beguile their youth in the 1920s and 30s of interwar Britain if you can even assume that people in Europe in those days lived between two wars rather than endured a long armistice between two terrifying resumptions of hostilities. Every time you read fragile truths in the New York Times, think of that as applying to the 1920s and 1930s in Europe, and you'll get a better idea of what those resumption of hostilities were. And yes, I think if I look at my brother and think, well, our parents got married in this day, 1945, that is a little unsettling. It's also, I think, hope you don't mind my saying so, rather reassuring. We are both here, after all, and determined to testify. Now, on this question about the Mesopotamian War, um, <laughs> everybody knows why they oppose it, don't they? Everyone's clear on what their reasons are. Um, we were told uh, wrong things. We were given inaccurate information by dubious governments. We were sort of cheated into a, a feeling that we are... Uh, our uh, delegations at the UN uh, had overstated the matter of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. In fact, when you think about it, um, you'll find that it's probably even wrong to mention Saddam Hussein in the same breath as weapons of mass destruction or terrorism. I have a couple of tests from, of my own for whether people know what they're talking about when they're talking about Iraq. Anyone who says that Saddam Hussein was, okay, a bad guy, doesn't know what they're talking about. You hear that said quite a lot. They don't know. They don't know what fascism feels like. They don't know what it's like to see families forced at gunpoint to applaud the torture and execution in public of their family members. 
They don't know what it's like to see 180,000 members of the Kurdish people at a minimum killed by poison gas in the northern provinces of Iraq. They don't know what it's like to see at least that number of uh, Shia Arabs killed in southern Iraq. They don't know what it took Anglo-American, British-American policy to put a no-fly zone from 1991 onwards over those two zones to make sure that those two genocides could not be replicated. They don't know what it would be like to be a citizen of Kuwait or Iran seeing Saddam Hussein's army coming over the horizon, attacking your civilians in that way, abolishing, in one case, the whole existence of a member state of the Arab League and of the uh, Muslim, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Islamic Conference and of the United Nations, abolishing it, annexing it, making it part of Iraq. They, don't, they didn't hear the speech from Saddam Hussein saying the only mistake he ever made was that he invaded Kuwait before he'd finished the nuclear weapon. He should have done it the other way around. First get the nuclear weapon that, at the Tuatha uh, reactor which we found of, as a result of the Kuwait war when we weren't looking for it. Get the bomb first, then invade Kuwait, then ask them what they're going to do now, now that I've invaded it. Don't do it, don't get it the wrong way around. We lived at this man's permission for a long time. We lived by his warrant. Only his stupidity allowed us uh, to be uh, as complacent as we were. And in the meantime, uh, fighters in northern and southern Iraq were fighting against a tyrant who we should have been fighting ourselves. The liberation of Iraq in other words, the decision that we had to move the Iraqi people and the region into a post-Saddam era will stand, I'm convinced, as one of the greatest decisions of American statecraft, as one of the things that American soldiers, male and female, and politicians who voted for it, and those who've defended it, will be proudest of in the future of any decision we've ever made. And despite the ridicule, despite the incompetence, Despite the failures, despite the disappointments, let us review what we've done. First, we have removed a keystone state of the Middle East from the control and sole ownership of a psychopathic crime family who owned all of Iraq and treated its people as if they were disposable citizens. I remind you that this keystone state occupies a choke point on the Gulf and an arterial carotid point in the world economy that cannot be left the control of a fascistic mafia. I remind you further that it exists between the uh, exorbitant uh, Sunni Wahhabi theocracy of Saudi Arabia and the no less exorbitant Shia theocracy of Iran. That it is, it is the keystone that allows us, yes us, we who have the right to do this. We who have the right to insist on oil. We who don't have to be ashamed of mentioning oil in the same breath as democracy to say if we can recuperate Iraq, if we can recuperate its oil industry, if we can stop it being the private property of a psychopathic crime family, we can not only help the Iraqis, but we can undercut the monopoly or the duopoly of Shia Iran and Wahhabi Saudi Arabia. Does anyone think this is a matter of indifference? Or is anyone willing to get up and say, you sir, very good for you, I admire your Nerve, I wouldn't mind if you were the only one, as you seem to be. You're indifferent to it. Um, the rest of us here, voters and consumers, all believers in uh, freedom, uh, might possibly want to take the view that it can't be for us a nothing question what happens to Iraq. We'll add, one in the remaining time, that we have brought one of the great uh, war criminals of the world to justice and put him and his crime family and his main uh, complicit associates on trial in public in a country where until recently, very recently, it was death, slow death, very slow death to possess a cell phone or a satellite dish. That we have undone what UNESCO calls the greatest crime against the human ecology ever committed, the destruction of the marshes 
of uh, southern Iraq, the oldest wetlands in the Middle East, the smoke and destruction of which could be seen from the space shuttle. So terrible was the uh, environmental decay. That we have uh, proclaimed uh, the autonomy of the Kurdish people, the oldest uh, and largest uh, nation in the world not to have a state of their own, and that where they live in their federalized, uh, democratized provinces in northern Iraq, which were released from Saddam Hussein's control uh, a full 12 years before the liberation of the rest of the country, uh, business flourishes, uh, press flourishes, democracy flourishes, civil society flourishes. The sooner, the earlier the intervention by the British and American forces in Iraq, in other words, the happier, the sooner, the greater, the deeper, the more enduring, and the more useful in the future is the outcome. Um, I'm willing to defend, because I've just seen time, I'm willing to defend and underline and repeat and restate and emphasize everything I have said so far. So all of you who've come here under the pathetic illusions peddled by Hillary Clinton, Harry Reid, and MoveOn.org have all your work still ahead of you. And you thought it was going to be easy, didn't you? Bye now. Thank you, Christopher. Peter, the next five minutes are yours. Oh, thank you. The uh, lesser breeds without the law were the Germans. It was the law that they were outside that made them lesser. I just thought I had to add that. Right, consequences of the Iraq war. Uh, Six trillion dollars, which the United States does not have, expended. Iraq under the control largely of the Ayatollahs of Iran. Uh, the resorts to torture by the United States, often by proxy, but not always. Disgraces in themselves and disasters. An untold number of innocent people killed. The certainty that the United States is unable for the foreseeable future to mount a justified military operation abroad. The diminution of the moral authority of the Western democracies, again, for the foreseeable future. Fantastic. What more could you ask? Resulting from deliberate ignorance of the past, deliberate willful ignorance of the past, of Britain's own attempts to control and exploit and govern Iraq through fake parliaments and fake elections, at least more successful for a while in gaining the cooperation of at least one of the Iraqi factions without necessarily having to pay them to fight by the day with AK-47s against our enemies instead of against us. Again, triumph. I really do not see what justification there could be of the operation on its own merits. But if it is a principle that the United States has to e intervene in every country which is misgoverned, where there are despots, where there is torture, where there is no freedom, then where else can anybody in this room think of that we might be intervening? For instance, the site of the Summer Olympics might occur to some, but we do not. Nor if we're terribly tender about the massacres of, uh, of, of Arabs by Arabs, or the citizens of Arab states by other Arab states, why is it that we accepted as our allies in the first Gulf War the state of Syria, whose then president, Hafez al-Assad, ordered his troops with artillery to surround the town of Hama and shell it until everyone living in it was dead. If our principle is that we only associate with uh, nice foreign regimes and we always attack and devastate nasty ones, where was that principle then? None of it makes sense. None of the objectives turned out to be true. When I was in Iraq for the first time, only a few weeks after the invasion, people crowded round me in Najaf and Kabul saying, and many of them spoke English, they said, Thanks very much indeed for coming. Now will you please get out? And that was the nicest thing that anybody said to me all the time. I was there. How can anyone stand here and say that this is a success? All I can say is that it must take the most enormous courage and resolution to continue to stick to an obviously losing argument.
Well, it's obviously come to the actuarial. Uh, seems a waste of Hitchensism in a way to just reduce things to the balance sheet, but we do balance sheet, we do balance sheet properly. Um, let me uh, suggest some things to you. First, um, everybody knows that there isn't a single clever person here who doesn't know, is there, or watching this on a webcast, who doesn't know that you can't mention weapons of mass destruction and, and Saddam in the same breath, even though he used them against, uh, against uh, Iran and against the, the Kurds, wrongly described as his own people within the borders of his own country, and uh, was continuing to incubate and maintain the capacity to recover them. Um, however, for actuarial purposes, let me just say that having enforced the resolutions that governed this question in the case of Iran, we forced the capitulation of Colonel Gaddafi, whose stock of WMD we had underestimated when he came in. And he didn't surrender, I might add, to Kofi Annan or Jack Chirac. Where did, where did Colonel Gaddafi come a few weeks after the fall of Baghdad to say, OK, you can take all my stockpile now and put it in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where it now is, which is where it should have been. He didn't come to Kofi Annan. Hold your applause, comrades. I know I'm never going to get any from a uh, um, But thanks for, thanks for trying. Um, I sort of appreciate it. Um, he didn't come to Kofi Annan or Jacques Chirac or, or the prostituted, uh, equally prostituted Gerhard Schroeder the real blood for oil pimps and prostitutes uh, who constituted the leadership of the anti-war movement in European politics. No, he came to Tony Blair and he came to George Bush and said, I give up. Okay, let's have a look at this big stockpile that Colonel Gaddafi's got all this time. Um, it's bigger than we thought, much bigger than we thought. We accused him of a lot. It was much worse than we thought, as it had been with Saddam Hussein at the time of Kuwait, much worse than we thought. Well, let's have another look. Where's he got it from? Where's it come from? It's come from North Korea. And it's come from Pakistan. Pakistan, our ally. So by walking back the cat, as it's called in Washington, we discover from this capitulation the AQ Khan network. We shut it down. Or well, at least we put its leader under house arrest. At least for now. At least we put the North Koreans in the frame, and they know we've got them. This is the biggest non-proliferation victory there has ever been for any US administration ever in history. That's the first thing. The second is, we catch the guy who rolled Leon Klinghoffer off the deck of a cruise ship in the Mediterranean, who avoided arrest when he was caught, had to be released, because he was traveling on a, a diplomatic passport. A what passport? A what passport? A diplomatic passport. What diplomatic passport? An Iraqi diplomatic passport. Just like Abu Nidal had been traveling on, just as like every other terrorist gang you've ever heard of in the Middle East had been headquartered in Baghdad. We shut that down too. You think this is nothing? You think it's nothing. You want to sneer at it and say, Bush says, mission accomplished? Sneer. Go on, sneer. These achievements are real. There are four, four reasons for which a state, previously sovereign, may lose its sovereignty may be deemed to be outside the law. They are four. I'll recite them quickly. One, violations of the Genocide Convention, which we have signed. And by the way, by all means, let's impose this on Sudan. And by all means, let's impose it on them for Darfur. And on China for many other offenses too. Because just as China has backed Saddam Hussein, and just as it backs Robert Mugabe, and just as it's backed uh, the worst elements uh, in Burma, so it has been behind many of our woes in um, the Middle East. So that's the first thing. The Genocide Convention may not be violated. We've signed it. It mandates that you must move to punish or prevent genocide. Second, a regime loses its sovereignty if it violates the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Iraq has used weapons of mass destruction on its own territory and on the territory of others. Third, you may uh, lose your sovereignty if you give aid, comfort, and harbor to international terrorist groups. Iraq is multiply convicted of this. And fourth, for occupying and invading the territory of other nations, which Iraq had done several times, continued to do, and was intending to do again. This is not, unfortunately, 
uh, the case with all the despots we'd like to get rid of. The cheap point that Peter ends with saying, if, you can, if you're going to do Saddam Hussein, don't you have to do anybody, must reach the critical standard I've just mentioned, the four great offenses, repeated, flagrant, gross, and intentional, and, in, and going to be repeated, all of them again. It was essential that we move Iraq and the region into a post-Saddam Hussein era, and the, the woes that have fallen upon us, the second thoughts we're bound to have, the worries uh, about the, the blunders that we made while doing it, none of which I would deny, and some of which I know more about than you could dare to know. I know things about what went wrong that would curl your hair. Still, none of these can impeach the idea that we did it not too soon, but much too late. And that only therein lies our shame. Thank you. Thank you for spirited debate on our first topic. By prior agreement, the second topic concerns God. The proposition is, God does not exist and he is not great. A historical note Exactly 80 years ago, back in 1928, Clarence Darrow debated a similar proposition within these walls. Well, since Peter went first on the previous question, Christopher will go first on this one. Christopher, 10 minutes. You mean you're, okay, you mean you're ready for another burst from, okay, from CH. That's, there's something wrong with this coin toss business. Um, okay, let me see. I don't think it's going to take 10 minutes to disprove the existence of God. Um, the, the atheist proposition is the following, most of the time. It may not be said that there is no God. It may be said that there is no reason to think that there is one. That was the situation after Lucretius and Democritus and the original anti-theistic uh, thinkers began their critique of religion, and I would just ask you all, ladies and gentlemen, to bear in mind a, a mild distinction while we go on. You may wish to be a deist, as my uh, heroes Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine were, and you may not wish to abandon the idea that there must be some sort of first or proximate cause or prime mover of uh, the known and observable world and universe but even if you can get yourself to that position, which we unbelievers maintain is always subject to better and more perfect and more elegant explanations, even if you can get yourself to that position, all your work is still ahead of you. To go from being a deist to a theist, in other words, from someone who says, God cares about you, knows who you are, minds what you do, answers your prayers, cares which bits of your penis or clitoris you saw away or have sawn away for you, minds who you go to bed with and in what way, minds what holy days you observe, minds what you eat, minds what positions you use for pleasure, all your work is still ahead of you and lots of luck. Because there's nobody, there's nobody, even Aquinas had to give it up. There's no one who can move from the first position to the second. So I could, and I'm actually strongly tempted to. I can leave it right there. But then it's not in my nature to um, let off a captive audience so easily. <laughs> so I'll add a couple of things. The reasons why I am glad this is not true would, I suppose, be the gravamen of my case. Some people I know who are atheists will say they wish they could believe it. Some people I know who are former believers say they wish they could have their old faith back. They miss it. I don't understand this at all. I think it's, a, it's, it's an excellent thing that there's no reason to believe in the absurd propositions I just uh, admittedly rather briefly rehearsed to you. Um, the main reason for this, I think, is that it is a totalitarian belief. It is the wish to be a slave. It is the desire that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep, who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance, 
around the clock, every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born, and even worse than where the real fun begins, after you're dead. <laughs> A celestial North Korea. <laughs> Who wants this to be true? Who but a slave desires such a ghastly fate? I've been to North Korea. It has a dead man as its president, Kim Jong-il, is only head of the party and head of the army. He's not head of the government or the state. That office belongs to his deceased father, Kim Il-sung. It's a necrocracy, <laughs> a thanatocracy. It's one short of a trinity, I might add. The Son is the reincarnation of the Father. It is the most revolting and utter and absolute and heartless tyranny the human species has ever evolved. But at least you can fucking die and leave North Korea. <laughs> does the Quran, does the Quran or the Bible offer you that liberty? No. No, the tyranny, the misery, the utter ownership of your entire personality, the smashing of your individuality only begins at the point of death. This is evil. This is a wicked preachment. So, that's the first thing. <laughs> Second, it attacks us in our deepest, in our deepest, most essential integrity. It's an insult to us in other ways. It says that we, you and I, could not, individually or collectively, decide upon a right action or a right thing without celestial divine permission. We would not know right from wrong if we did not have heaven's uh, permission to do so. Where else, how else could we know? Our human solidarity, our innate knowledge of right and wrong, our, 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 our acute awareness of what is fair and what is unfair, what is just and worthless to us, these come to us also as gifts from uh, the great unassailable uh, dictator and throne. What, what, what could abolish our integrity? What could abolish our honesty, our decency, our dignity more than that? The second, third, uh, is a little more pragmatic. Um, religion is our first, that's why I'm so fascinated with it, it's our first version of the truth. It's our first attempt as a species. It's what we tried when we didn't know anything. We didn't know we lived on a spherical planet. We didn't know that our planet revolved around the sun. Uh, we didn't know that there were microorganisms that explained disease. We thought diseases came from curses or witches or uh, ill-wishing or uh, uh, devils or dust devils. We didn't know anything from the childish, terrified, ignorant uh, origins of our animal primate species we come to religion. It's also our first attempt at philosophy, our first attempt at morality, our first attempt at healthcare, actually, but because it was our first, it is our worst. We now have better explanations for all these dreads, and we have cleared up all of these mysteries, yet we still dwell. Um, and in some countries, in some societies, not just dwell, but live under, under a totalitarian regime that forbids us to think about the progress that has been made, or denies us the knowledge that these adv advances have in fact occurred. So it has become, uh, where once it probably was an aid to our survival, um, a, a really great peril to our continued ability to live as a civilized species. Thus, it seems to me that in point of its uh, proposing of a totalitarian solution to what is after all a real problem, to its ghastly uh, reliance upon the supernatural rather than the much more miraculous, much more beautiful, much more elegant, much more numinous, much more harmonious natural explanations. Think how much lovelier uh, Einstein and Darwin are. Think how, how, how much more uh, elegant and persuasive they are than the idea of the burning bush. Or the, or, the, or, the, or the demand that without circumcision there can be no redemption. Just, just picture it. And then I'll, I'll give you one final thought experiment. This is what you have to believe now, if you're a monotheist. 
because we, we now know things we didn't used to know. We know that the human species could be as much as 200,000 years ago. Did it, did it become separate from the Cro-Magnons and the, um, uh, the rival prehuman species? Could be as little as 100. Richard Dawkins thinks 200,000. Francis Collins, who did the Human Genome Project, who's, by the way, C.S. Lewis kind of Christian, thinks 100,000. All right, I'll take 100. I'll take 100. Here's what you have to believe. For 100,000 years, humans are born as a primate species. Expectation of life, what, 25 years for the first few 100,000 years? First few tens of thousand years. Infant mortality, rife. M microorganism disease, terrifying. Earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, extraordinary. But, and fights over land, over territory, over food, over women, over tribalism. Frightening too. For 95, 96,000 years, heaven watches this with folded arms, with indifference, with coldness. And then around three to 4,000 years ago, but only in really barbaric, illiterate parts of the Middle East, <laughs> not in China, not in China or where people can read or think or do science, no, no, no in barbaric, illiterate, backward parts of the Middle East, it's decided we can't let this go on, we better intervene. <laughs> and what better way than by human sacrifices and plagues and mass murder? And if that doesn't make them behave morally, we just don't know what does. <laughs> if there is a single person in this room who can bring themselves to believe anything remotely like that, they convict themselves of being, first, very stupid, and second, very immoral. And thus, it seems to me that the case for divine intervention and for the supernatural falls, and that we should be glad that it's fallen. And thank you. Peter, 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I can tell you're all enjoying the post-Saddam era, uh, which, uh, which we were told was so good. I, I, I wonder whether an invasion of uh, the uh, celestial reason, regions might now uh, be in order, and we could then have a post-God era, which would be of similar delightful quality. I am amazed, when confronted with this argument, how little my brother seems to know of that which he attacks. How he prefers to mock and belittle, how he prefers to select from it all those things which I think most educated believers themselves are troubled by, how he imagines that people other than himself do not seem ever to have been troubled by the things which trouble him, and nonetheless have come to the conclusion, despite all, that belief in a God, in my case, God, call him by his first name, that belief in God is nonetheless wise, beneficial, and good, not just for ourselves, but for the universe. If only the, how shall I say, the flippant, jeering tone could be abandoned for a moment, and we could discuss this more seriously. It seems to me to be incurious to the point of tedium to examine the universe and not to ask yourself certain very powerful questions. The first of which is, why is there something rather than nothing? The second of which is, since we do not know anything at all about our origins and must work out what we think we know from extremely scanty evidence, that it would be unwise to form absolute certainties on this. Now the character of the book, God is Not Great, which my brother wrote, is one entirely of the jeering 
the mocking, the caricature, the picking out of that which is bad. What? I do Stop not think. That. Stop I do that. not think that this. Sorry, did you wish to intervene? No, no sir. Please. I'm telling him not to. You sure? I mean, he, I did, no. This, Stop. Absolutely. Stop that. No. Right. Um, that's Stop. that's the end of the Christian no charity for the, for the moment. Um, had it been clapping. couched, of course, in a more generous tone, it would have been less fun to do. And who knows, there might have been other consequences in the bookshops, I don't know. But since it wasn't couched in that tone, that is what we have to argue with. And I would simply say this. First of all, for a while, I'm surprised you haven't asked it tonight, uh, my brother would go around saying that there was uh, a, a question which no believer could answer about what action could, uh, no, um, could no believer take which an unbeliever could or something of of that character, to which I would reply, the question of morality is utterly irrelevant to you if you genuinely believe that which you say you believe. If you think that there is no authority, if you think that we are the products of random chaos, if there is no reason for the existence of the universe apart from a series of accidents, then you may behave exactly as you wish. Now, in the case of Christopher and his uh, ally and uh, colleague, uh, Professor Dawkins, I refer to this as luxury atheism. I know where they live. They live in very pleasant parts of very pleasant cities, and they are able to advance the theory of atheism purely as a theory. Well, I live in England, and I don't need to travel very far from my home, which is not far from Professor Dawkins' home, in Oxford to find a large number of highly practical atheists. In my country, it is common, no more than three or four times a week, to read accounts of people being kicked to death by youths aged between about 13 and 17. It invariably ends with the phrase, and then they started kicking his head as if it were a football. These accounts grow more and more common. If you venture into the areas where these people live, you will find a complete absence of any kind of moral feeling whatsoever a complete absence of self-government among the strong, among the healthy, among those who are able to control and take advantage of their neighbors. Christianity and everything that went with it have vanished from among them. They are practical atheists, and they really mean it. In fact, in some ways, they're not atheists. If you examine my country carefully, you'll find that the worship of Mark, the slaughter of children at the rate of 180,000 a year in the womb, continues that the worship of Mammon is out of control, that the worship of Ashtaroth is pretty well advanced as well, and a number of the other <laughs> pagan gods there, way out in front of the dear old Anglican Jehovah in whom I attempt to believe. All this seems to me to point to an important factor in religion, which is why it seems to me that it is reasonable, given that we are ignorant of the answer as to whether there is or is not a God and cannot know, why we might reasonably think that it was worth believing in such a being. If the universe does have an order, if it does have an origin, if there is running through it an eternal law, then wouldn't it be a good idea to try to find out what it was and to seek to govern ourselves by it? Now, I too have been to North Korea, and I will tell you that I have the opposite impressions to that which my brother had. This is a country entirely run by people who hate and despise the idea of God and who have made themselves into gods. And that, indeed, is what so very often happens when people ignore the very, very earliest part of the Bible in which the serpent says to Adam and Eve, eat of this fruit and ye shall be as gods. This is what we do when we decide for ourselves that there is nothing above us. We destroy authority. We destroy all the things which turn the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. They go. They are going very rapidly in my country. I suspect that if things proceed as they are in our educational system and our trash culture, they will happen pretty rapidly in this one too. And then you will know then you will know what happens when God is truly absent, not because he isn't there, 
but because the only place he can occupy lies within our heart. And either he is there because we invite him and we seek his assistance in the governing of ourselves, or he is not, and we cease to be able to govern ourselves because we no longer know how to do so. There are many forms of morality. I'm told that human solidarity is a way of, of running the world. Well, up to a point it is. But the problem with human solidarity is that it operates at different levels. Now, when I lived for some years in Moscow, it was folly uh, to expect anyone to hold open a door in the Moscow metro, big, heavy, steel and glass doors they were too, because nobody there knew anything about manners. They let the thing swing back in your face. And if I ever held the door open for somebody else, as I did in my naive early weeks in that city, they'd look at me as if I were mad. Now, something similar has begun to happen to me in Britain. I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking down the, 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 the aisle of a crowded train, and I see somebody coming the other way, struggling with luggage, and I think, well, I'll step out of the way and let them pass. Well, increasingly, the people behind me think I'm having a heart attack, so they barge past me. The breakdown of general assumptions about what is good affects the way that everybody behaves. You cannot have a private morality and, and it, it, for very long if the public morality is, is declining. And I say there are three stages of this. There's the wholly solipsistic, I will do what I want when there's nothing but left and right. And left is that way, this way, and it's the other way if I turn around. And then there's what you might call the shipboard morality, where there's port and starboard and there's fore and aft, but they change when the ship moves. And then there's the universal one, which flows from the universe, where there is true north and where there is no difference ever about which is right and which is wrong, and which is the root of all authority, the authority of the state which places power under the law, the authority of the family where the parents rule the children, the authority of the country where the people govern themselves under a law which will accept all these things derive from that understanding. Without it, we're lost. Why sneer at it? Why seek to bring it down? Why mock it? Why make silly jokes about circumcision? This is far more important than that. I really do wish he'd treat it seriously for once. Well, I, I know it's easy to sneer, but still, someone has to do it. <laughs> and if you like, um, I will stop with the uh, circumcision, which you think is a trivial thing. I mean, have you ever talked to anyone or interviewed anyone who's been subjected to female genital mutilation because of God's will? You wouldn't, think it, you wouldn't say it was trivial or tease if you had, let alone to the number of uh, boy children who die every year because of the covenant, uh, the hideous covenant that's imposed upon them by Mosaic law, um, which also, I might add, celebrates every year in all three monotheisms the decision of a father to put his knife to his son's throat because that's how much he loves the dictator. Now, I find this wicked, and I won't have my belief called frivolous. And any one of you who's prepared to show how much you love God and appreciate true north by holding a knife to your firstborn's throat to prove your devotion can stand up now or be regarded by my brother as someone who's not morally serious. And now you see the depth to which, now you see the depth, now you see the depth into which religion wants to throw you. Now, my book it does have a few jeers at religion, because after all, you know, in, the, in this veil of tears, let's do that. But it's been reviewed very seriously by many bishops, many rabbis, by the Pope's uh, chaplain in Rome, all of whom have said, as they've said about previous polemics of mine, that I make some points that they haven't yet come up with an answer to. The answer, the reason for that is because they can't. It's not in the nature of them to be able to do so. You either believe, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, in the idea of vicarious redemption or you do not. And you either think it's morally serious or you don't. In other words, you can either say, yes, I may have sinned badly, but I can throw my sins on another and he can take them from me and die for me and suffer for me and take my responsibility away, or you don't think so. 
I think vicarious redemption is the most immoral idea in current circulation. I could, if I wanted to, if I knew you, or even if I didn't know you, I could offer to take your debt and pay it. It's been done. People will do that for friends, for lovers, even for strangers. I could offer to serve your term in prison, if, if the law allowed it. Say, oh, I don't think you can do it. Probably I can. I'll serve your term. I'll do that for you. But to say, I'll take your sins away, you never committed them. They're all washed white as snow and clean as new. And, and you can watch me being tortured and put to death as a lamb, as a sheep. And I'll call you a sheep. And my congregation will be called a flock from then on. is a double humiliation. First, it's a hideous outrage on the scapegoat. Second, it's a terrible insult on those who agree to be called sheep. Anyone here want to stand up and say, I'm a sheep? I'm a lamb? Yes. Good for you. Anyone else? Good for the rest of you. Fine. Sheep you are. Um, it's not usually that easy. Uh, now, okay, why is there something, not nothing? Good question. Why is the universe expanding so fast now that it's just been discovered that the red shift of Edwin Hubble is not a, an expanding rate that is slowing down, as Newton would have had us believe, but is an expanding rate that is speeding up. People thought the physicists thought the universe would slow down. No, the rate of expansion is so great now that very soon it won't be possible. Read Lawrence Krauss's piece in the current scientific America. Would it even be possible to work out how we ever worked out what the Big Bang was? Such nothingness is coming to us, we won't even know where we were before. And in the meantime, the Andromeda galaxy is heading towards us directly. You can see it in the night sky now with the naked eye. And in five billion years, which is in physics time, nothing. It's tomorrow in physics time. It's here. So the something we have now is about to meet with a great deal of nothing. Some design, huh? Who designed that? The question always is the same, even with, without science, we knew what the philosophers knew. Anyone who claims this is a design must either convict the designer of one thing, extreme incompetence, and noodling and footling and chaotic planning, and or, and probably both, extreme cruelty, callousness, and indifference towards those whom he summoned into existence and made to suffer. These points cannot be overthrown by any kind of casuistry and certainly were not even challenged by the casuistical efforts you just heard. Thank you. Peter, five minutes. Yeah, unless I hope. Um, the knife at the throat was not used. And that is the point of the story. Why else is it told? The, those, one of the fascinating things about those who, who, who seek to sweep Christianity out of the society, and one of the things in Christa's book which is actively repellent, and the only thing in the book which I found actively repellent was a suggestion that Christianity should be treated as a form of child abuse and therefore driven out of education. One of the things these people do not seem to realize is that if you were to abolish it, it would not be replaced by a blank space. It is important to realize what it replaced, that the argument about that sacrifice was an argument about getting rid of human sacrifice and child sacrifice, then common. But what we are dealing with here is an immensely powerful force in human emotion, which existed before Christianity and which Christianity sought and seeks to divert elsewhere. You have to give people hope when they have done things whose remembrance is grievous and whose burden is intolerable. It has to be done. And what other hope can be offered than some kind of sacrifice? The arguments, the very complex arguments about that atonement are all to do with the discovery, as I said earlier, the attempt that we make in our feeble way to discover what it is that we are intended to do. But to mock them as if they, they were a matter of a, a, a man sticking a knife 
towards his son's throat with the idea that this was a recommended action in the manual of life is not merely a misunderstanding, it's falsehood. And it really shouldn't be acceptable in, in civilized debate to speak as if something is being advocated when it is actually being preached against. And it is, again, this, this, this failure of, of, of understanding of the purpose of the thing, the failure to understand that it has any good or benevolent characteristics whatsoever, when it does produce good characteristics, in the book you will find that those who are Christians who do good things are recruited to the atheist cause. No, they didn't do it because they were Christians, they did it because they were something else. And if, if societies do anything bad, then it, the, 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 the Stalinist state of the Soviet Union is said to have done those things because Stalinist communism was in fact a form of religion. You can't win. It's completely secular. There is nothing that anybody can do which is religious and which is based on a belief in God, which Christians will think is right, and if anybody does anything which is wrong, then it will be God's fault. And there is no escape from this circle, and I, I think it's very well exemplified in this, in, in this misrepresentation of one of the central stories in, in the Bible. Well, uh, my fellow uh, sheep-like Americans, um, is it not the case that uh, in the matter of the Aid, uh, the Muslim sacrifice, or in the matter of the uh, Abrahamic sacrifice of Isaac, that the first test the father must pass is to show his God that he's at least willing to do it, uh, that his submission can be taken for granted even to this extent. Is there anyone here who does not think that that is the grandeur of the story, as well as what I would describe as the horrible sadomasochistic submission? Only then, only when he's shown, yes, I will do it, that's how much I love Big Brother. Only then is he released from the obligation. This is the torturing. This is even worse than the book of Job. It's even worse than the toying uh, with, by the dictator of uh, the fate and emotions of one of his effortlessly made creatures. Anyone who loves this loves to be a slave. Now, on the, moral, on the point of morality, my, my brother has written very well in, in England and in, indeed elsewhere about the awful nihilism and uh, relativism that uh, has poisoned so much of our social and national uh, and collective life. And I have more agreement with him on this than perhaps he understands, but to say that this is to be equated with uh, atheism is simply to misunderstand what nihilism and relativism mean. And that's very... I think I can make this point relatively simply. Um, someone who says uh, that do what you will must be the whole of the law, that's, supposed, that's supposedly what Satanists say at their ceremonies. By the way, Satanists are not atheists by definition. Their satanic majesties are not non-entities. Um, uh, is saying, uh, is giving themselves permission to act entirely as they might wish, at their own pleasure. How does the person who says, God is on my side, act? I don't demand an answer from you. I simply demand you think about my question. How do those act who say, God is on my side? Do they not act as if, do they not, do they not behave in Iran, in Iraq, in Bombay, in Beirut, in Belfast, as if they have the right to do anything at all because God has given them permission? Yes, they do. You don't get rid of nihilism. You don't get rid of relativism by claiming you have God in your corner. Rather, you make, you, make it, you make it possible for any torture, any cruelty, any child abuse, any nightmare of violence and shame to be yours and to be proud of it too. Now, I have two challenges that Peter has despised in the past, but I'm going to repeat them to you and you decide what you think. If you think that morality must be supernaturally referred that without heavenly 
dictatorship, we would not have a moral guide. You must have an answer to this question, which I've now asked in print many times, in public many times, radio, TV, any, any number of times, you've not yet had an answer to. Name me a uh, moral action performed or a moral action recommended or a moral statement made by a believer. Name me one by a true believer in religion that could not, could not have been made by a non-believer. Name me one. Think about it. I'm not demanding an answer now. You have all evening. However, you won't need all evening for my corollary question. Name me a wicked statement or a stupid or evil statement made or stupid or evil action performed by someone claiming God's permission to do so. You've already thought of one. Before this evening is over, you'll have thought of two or three more. The connection between religion and morality proposed by the believers in supernatural dictatorship is thoroughly, utterly, morally null and void. In fact, it's worse than that. It, it is an excuse for, and has always been, continues to be and will be an excuse for worse evil than any secularist or atheist could ever have permitted themselves or others. Glad you got that point. Peter. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I can think of actually an instance of something which a, uh, a believer did and an unbeliever didn't do, uh, which is that a few years ago I resigned from my newspaper when it was taken over by a man whose main business was pornography. And I was surprised the other week uh, to uh, see a copy of another sister newspaper owned by that same man uh, being adorned by a column written by my brother. I didn't, get... I, didn't, I didn't get that bit. Would you want, do you mind saying it again? I'd, uh... I don't mind at all. Um, you may remember... I, that didn't, I... I just didn't hear it. I'm, sorry, I'm not trying to be funny. Okay, no, no. I, I, I resigned, if you recall, from the Daily Express uh, about seven years ago when it was taken over by a man whose main business was pornography. I was slightly surprised a few weeks ago to find uh, that uh, a column written by you appeared in one of his newspapers. But that isn't a response to either of my I challenges, is it? I mean, you ask for one I submit myself to the arbitration of the audience. That doesn't answer either of my questions. I, by the way, I'll tell you two answers I have had, the best two. One is an exorcism to throw out a devil couldn't be performed by a non-believer. <laughs> a better try than the one Peter's just come up with, but a bit of a tautology. And the second that I got only yesterday from a very thoughtful writer uh, of a letter from, I think, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, is um, could John Donne, one of my favorite poets, along with George Herbert, a religious poet, have written those songs and sermons if he had not been a believer? The answer to that, which has kept me awake longer than any of the other ones, is that I don't know. Because I don't know how Verdi wrote the Requiem while being an atheist, either. But I think that the fact that I don't know the answer to the second question means that the answer hasn't been proposed by the proposed answer to the first one, uh, let alone by uh, Peter's lame attempt to complain about the fact that my column is more widely syndicated than his. <laughs> Peter, did well, you want to respond? Sorry. More widely and promiscuously syndicated than his. However widely I was syndicated, I wouldn't want it there. Well, thank you. That concludes part one of our debate, and as advertised, I think it was provocative as uh, we anticipated. Part two gives you, the audience, the chance to put questions to the brothers. I think they're doing a good job putting questions to each other, but why don't we mix it up a little bit. And uh, if you'll come to the microphones at the end of each aisle, there's also, I believe, a microphone upstairs. Although I do not, okay, it's back in this corner over here. If you would please take your place at the microphone. And let's go ahead and start since we have a queue over here. Let's go ahead and start with you. Yes, ma'am. Professor. Hello. 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 Okay. We can hear you. Professor Hitchens, um, can you? Don't uh, 
I heard you correct someone in a previous no, no. talk and <laughs> tell them. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, can you speak on what you see as the relationship between self-interest, enlightened self-interest, and morality? And? Morality. The, the lady, in case it wasn't audible to all, the lady asks if I will comment on the relationship between enlightened self-interest and morality. My line is not uh, that taken by, um, for example, Ayn Rand, um, that, that, that selfishness is a virtue um, on its own. Uh, I don't believe in the abnegation of the personality. I don't believe in the horrible uh, Christian idea of, of, of masochism, um, modesty, self-sacrifice, self-hatred, the endless confessions of, of sin and worthlessness, any more than I believe in the equally vile Quranic idea that we're made not out of dust but out of clots of blood by a, by a celestial dictator. But I think that probably we are innately selfish enough to begin with um, because of the process of evolution by natural selection that we don't need additionally to cultivate uh, our own selfishness and that the, the trick, the clue and the odd thing and the thing that comes to people strangely naturally is this um, they understand about human solidarity I'll just take, I'll just give you two examples, one from each testament um, the uh, ancient Jewish people of course never went to Sinai and never were in Egypt and, and never wandered in the desert and all of that is completely as everyone now knows from archaeological evidence none of that ever occurred but the idea that um, our, our Jewish ancestors got as far as Mount Sinai under the impression that rape, murder, theft and perjury were okay and only when told by tablets that they weren't all right, uh, felt the penny drop or the shekel drop, um, is, of course, an insult to our decency and our integrity. They couldn't have got that far or been a people of any kind if they had been under any other impression. So this is innate in us, and it is, comes from our solidarity, our humanity, our brother and sisterhood. The second is from the, the new, so-called New Testament, the, the Samaritan, so-called, the, the man from Samaria, who wouldn't see someone just lie bleeding and, and suffering by the side of the road without helping him. Whatever motive he had, and we don't know what it was, he can't have been a Christian because it's the alleged Jesus of Nazareth telling the story about someone who existed before he did. And the only people in the story who were told about who didn't do anything for the victim are the priests and the Levites. So what the story tells us, this parable, is you don't need religion to behave with ordinary decency and morality. And anyone who says you do, says that you need dictatorial permission to do the right thing. And then you're a serf. Um, it's in uh, my interest that people don't suffer. I don't want, I don't want someone bleeding to death from AIDS on my doorstep. For, not just for their sake, for mine I don't want that. Um, Oscar Wilde in The Soul of Man Under Socialism puts it very beautifully. He says, socialism would free us from the awful necessity of living for others. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, when he ran for office in London, said there should be no more houses built for the working classes without baths. And, and it was objected to him by the Tories and the Conservatives. Said, Why give them baths? The poor are so ignorant and stupid, they won't even know how to use them. Uh, they'll keep coal in them. Uh, they don't deserve baths. You're wasting your compassion on them. He said, I don't want them to have a bath for their sake. I want them to have a bath for my sake. <laughs> That's the right mix of self-interest and morality. And it works, too. It works. It works. Whereas religious exhortation and telling people, telling children that if, if they don't do the right thing, they'll go to terrifying punishments or unbelievable rewards. That's making a living out of lying to children. That's what the priesthood do. And if all they did was lie to the children, it would be bad enough. But they rape them and torture them and then hope we'll call it abuse. No, the priesthood must get out of the way for this argument to become grown up.
I'd say two brief points. The fact that you know something is wrong does not necessarily mean that you don't then do it, as I think most of us are aware. And secondly, it's all very well saying the people uh, who are unbelievers know what is right, but how do they know it's right? How they, what, what's, what reason do you have to suppose that any action is right apart from that which suits you? There is none, and, 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 you, and you can have none. You may borrow uh, with pleasure uh, the morality of the religious if you wish to do so, but to pretend that by doing so you're not borrowing it is an untruth. And I, I really, it's, it's amazing how difficult it is to get atheists to understand this very simple point. And one other point about threatening people with terrible punishments, it seems to me to be fairly evident, uh, looking again at my own country, that in societies which do not believe in hell, hell pretty quickly comes into existence. Bah! You're going to clap that? Who clapped that? Stand up who clapped that. Okay, we Did have other people that? want to ask questions. Let's move on to our next questioner. Uh, Dr. Hitchens, uh, quick question Professor. is, uh, truth real, <laughs> and if so, how do you determine it? Excuse me, it's my fault. I stepped on your line. Would you mind repeating your question? It was brief, I think, sir. Do, is truth real? Does it exist? And is, if so, how do you determine it? Once more. Is truth real, and if so, how do you determine ah. it? Okay, well, having attacked relativism on purpose, I should maybe uh, specify precisely what I meant. It, to say, huh, it's a famous line, as you know, what is truth asked a jesting conscious pilot and did not stay for an answer? Well, it's a, it's a long stay if you do stay for it. I mean, what, what I believe to be the case is that the, there is a difference between fair-mindedness, um, impartiality, even-handedness and objectivity, which is the search for the truth and the willingness to say that upon coming upon an uncomfortable truth, if it was at one's own expense, meant one had to change one's own opinion or analysis, one, one would be um, obliged to do so. That's what objectivity means. And I think that while the, the grail of truth may not be entirely attainable, without the idea of it, um, and without the obligation to seek it uh, very intensely and, and, and very seriously, one would be in a rudderless world, a world without true north, if you like. Uh, but the, uh, as Rabbi Hillel says, um, the, the, um, you, the task may be unattainable, but that does not mean you can give it up. Rabbi Hillel, by the way, who is the author of The Golden Rule, which the Christians so often claim to be their own. Uh, wrongly, falsely, lyingly, um, and doubly falsely, actually, because the obligation to love others as yourself is an unattainable one. And it's sinister for that reason, because you're demanded, it's demanded of you that you, that you do the impossible. Thus, you'll always be falling short. Thus, you'll always be in sin. Thus, you'll always be guilty. Thus you'll always have to confess. Thus you'll always be in the claws of the priests. Um, that's the trick, as, uh, as it's said by Fulk Greville, you're created sick and commanded to be well. This is a sadomasochistic relationship with the dictator. You can't be right. You'll always be wrong. The law is such as you can't keep it. Whereas the, the relatively sane injunction of the Babylonian rabbi at least, is, is what is repulsive to another, no, sorry, what is repulsive to you, you should not do to another. That's a decent rule, but no one, no one had better stand up and tell me that I need a God to tell me that. Peter, did you want to respond? No, I love it. Okay, we have a question up in the balcony. Yes, this is a question for Professor Hitchens again. Um, doctor. Do doctor, <laughs> fair enough. On your, uh, your website and in the, your books, uh, Build Up That Wall, you mention um, the eliminating taxation, freedom of taxation for churches, 
And I was wondering what your thoughts were as to how that might, if we were to someday do something like that, how that might affect the separation of church and state that we enjoy right now. Well, um, it seems to me a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment that any religious institution can receive any payment from the United States government. I would regard being tax exempt or tax free as a disguised form of subsidy, as I regard the so-called faith-based initiative to be a surreptitious violation of the same. Yeah. I should say for sincere believers that um, there is a, there's an excellent reason why the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment was first proposed. It wasn't proposed just by people like myself who, who wouldn't go any further than deism in their attitude to religion. It was proposed by many people who were quite devout and who thought not just that the government must not be corrupted by religion, but that the churches mustn't be corrupted by the association with the state either. And I think that's an equally morally valid point. Uh, James Madison, the co-author of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom and, and of the First Amendment and the other things that bodyguard our, 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 our uh, wonderful Republican secular constitution, didn't think there should be chaplains to open Congress, didn't even think there should be chaplains in the armed forces. If you want to pray in the army, they can. No one can stop them, but we're not going to pay for someone to pray over. These are very uh, tough questions, but it must be understood that these were part of the very urgent views of the framers and the founding fathers, and it's our responsibility to be discussing this very seriously now at a time when Hillary Clinton has joined some reactionary uh, evangelical organization, John McCain, to try and bolster her faith-based connections. John McCain, a lifelong Episcopalian, has this year, I wonder why, said he's a Baptist. <laughs> and uh, Barack Obama, Senator Obama, has been caught in some big mouth, sinister, windbag, rock and roll, horror show church on the South Side. <laughs> religion, religion, is poisoning, religion is poisoning our election and our democratic republic, and it's time <laughs> that we set it up. If you, want to be, if you want to be a fraud and a fundraiser and a, and a shakedown artist and a big mouth and an ethno-racist in this country, try your best. But it's, in, it's long past time that we said putting reverend in front of your name is not enough of an achievement. To do that. We sort of agreed uh, 200 or so years ago that... Um, we in Britain would not intervene in United States politics, and I, I feel I should <laughs> up, uphold this tradition. But there is one small point here. There's a tremendous air of challenge and bravery and, uh, and uh, hurling uh, himself into a storm of rage and oppression uh, in all this stuff. Uh, and I have to say, I do not find the Christian churches, either in this country uh, and especially not in my own particularly terrifying force to combat or one which is capable of crushing a dissenter. However, I would challenge him, for instance, to uh, wage any kind of campaign of dissent against the dreadful tyranny uh, of, uh, for instance, the theory of man-made global warming, against which it is almost death to speak uh, if you wish to be in any kind of public life in either this country or mine. But I don't think he will because that requires a little bit more in the way of, how should I say? No, I won't say it. Well, as a matter of fact, do it? Do you want no, since, it? I mean, since I, I've warned you before about this clapping business. Um, <laughs> since that's a challenge, uh, I hope you won't mind if I speak again. It's not really my turn, but I have just written a piece for, for Free Inquiry, uh, a secular atheist magazine, a contributor, a regular column, to saying that it disturbs me to see how much the green movement is taking on the um, lineaments of a religion. That, that the human species has an original sin, in other words, existing, um, <laughs> uh, making smoke, um, other things that upset the air, um, that it will be punished for this, that uh, an Armageddon or an apocalypse is on its way, uh, that if all don't uh, understand this, that there could be terrible punishments and that there's only one true way out of it. No, I've already written that I don't like the tone of this at all. 
just in case. Good, this, you don't have to read. Every, you don't have to read everything I write. You don't, but you guys, you do. <laughs> and next time we talk, I will expect you to have read everything I write. Okay, our next question. Before I attempt to challenge Mr. Christopher Hitchens uh, with a question, Mr. I should, no, Professor Christopher Hitchens, thank you. I, I should say that I've taught uh, a number of your books here at Grand Valley State University. My students revere them, and, and so do I. Thank you. Um, uh, you've been a, a very eloquent critic of empire throughout your career, and as a young man, I admired you a great deal for it. Are you prepared to admit now that the United States adventure in Iraq is also uh, an adventure in imperial activity? Uh, well. And, and, and uh, you, you ask this audience uh, what a yes. person who acts as if God is on their side acts like. And I would suggest to you that that person acts much like the candidate you supported in 2004, George W. Bush, in a particular as regards the adventure in Iraq. Yes, yes. Now, I, I quite see, I quite understand your point. And my, my uh, response would be the following. Um, and I hope you're ready for it. And those who, I'll do my best. And those who did that clapping thing that they still haven't, uh, is this. Everything the United States has done in Iraq has been imperial since 1968, at least. When the Central Intelligence Agency claims that it helped install the Saddam Hussein wing of the Ba'ath Party, follow me here, not just the Ba'ath Party, bad enough, a fascist party with some Stalinist inflections, but the Saddam Hussein wing of it, in power in Baghdad. That's how the CIA claimed to have acted in 68. The United States was still an empire in 1974 when Henry Kissinger promised the Iraqi Kurds American support in their fight against Saddam Hussein with the backing of the Shah of Iran and Israel um, and didn't tell them that he was about to sell them out when Saddam Hussein and uh, the Shah of Iran were going to make a handshake over their dead bodies. That was just as imperial. It was, uh, the United States was an empire when Jimmy Carter gave a green light to Saddam Hussein to invade Iran in 1980 um, and told them, that with, through, with American intelligence supplied by satellite through Saudi Arabia, that they would uh, achieve a, sh a, a swift victory over the Iranians and probably recover the Arabic-speaking territories of Khuzestan, of Persia, for Iraqi control. That war, we reckon, I've been to the cemeteries in Iran and in Baghdad of that war, probably not less than a million and a half casualties. I'm just, I haven't factored in all the casualties. All of these were imperial. In other words, if the United States is either imperial or it isn't, if it is, it's just as imperial not to intervene in Iraq and to leave the status quo the way it is, as it is to intervene. In 2003, for the first time I know about, the United States intervened in Iraq on the right side. And I'm proud of having advocated that policy. Okay? I knew I wouldn't get any applause. But I just want you to know that's what I think is the distinction. No, no. Hold. Please. That's the distinction. Now, there was to, to not to intervene would have been just as imperialist. And that was the attitude that Kissinger, Scowcroft, Bush Sr., Pat Buchanan, and the other elements of the conservative and imperialist right did advocate because these are the Saudi lobby who are the core of imperialism in my hometown of Washington. They said, no, leave Saddam Hussein as the buffer state. We like things the way they are. Don't you tell me that's a non-interventionist policy, okay? And don't tell yourself that because you're letting yourself and your move on .org friends off much too lightly, okay? Voila. Uh, it seems to me to be fairly simple that to launch an aggressive war uh, is different from not launching an aggressive war. And if, if so you the can't tell the States difference, the aggressor, if you can't tell the difference, then uh, it, it, it's difficult to know where to begin. Uh, but I think I was accused of casuistry a few minutes ago, uh, and I think I can now return the accusation. Well, all right. Next question. Hi, I was going to ask Christopher a question, but... I, it's Christopher now, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. Christopher. But I, I, Getting very I, informal. I think I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask Peter a question. And your answer, I think, says a lot about honesty and your honesty. When you walk into a natural history museum and you look up at a 
Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil? How does that relate to your religious belief? What, I mean, how do you place that in your religious belief? And your answer, I think, is it'll, it'll, it'll speak volumes about... I, I'm not sure how, how it's supposed to. I, you'll, you'll, well, you'll have to explain this. Is there something I should, I, if you I, I, I hold should a think about? Your, if you hold a fossil in your hand, or if you look at a fossil in a new natural history museum, I, you're, you're, a, you're a believer. Obviously, that, that has to, those two things have to come together in some way in your mind. How do they? I'm sorry, I, I really don't know what you're driving at. I just don't. Peter, okay, I'll tell you. Perhaps, you know, perhaps per Professor Hitchens. I'm sure, I'm sure Christopher can help you. Don't, well, Christopher if you don't can mind help. me ventriloquizing, the last time we discussed this, and I don't hold you to it, I got the impression that you had some sympathy for the argument that it's called intelligent design. I think the questioner wants to know if you think there's merit in that argument or not. Yes. And well, I think you can't you possibly have not solved that point, by the way. <laughs> well, I, go ahead. Well, and if you say no... no so so what, what, what actually is the question? Do you settle that, then I'll answer it. Well, that's a, that's a good question. It's just a general question about if you walk into a natural history museum and you see these fossils... <laughs> oh, back to the museum. Do you think there's any merit to intelligent design? Uh, to me, the two cannot... They cannot. It's either one or the other. It's just an honest question. One what or one what or what? Belief. Give it up. Give it up. Are we at an impasse? <laughs> Forget it. Uh, sorry. How can you believe in a young Earth and a God? I think. Well, I don't believe in the young Earth. So you that's... don't? Then how? Then how can you uh, have a? I thought it was a question. What if, we, what if the question was, do you think intelligent design is an argument with merit? So pretend that was the question. So, I th <laughs> Sorry. It's these microphones. What, how did Actually, get? I'd like to know what you think. So, what, I, the do you think that intelligent design is an argument, a case, that has merit? Uh, yes. Uh, I think it's an interesting skeptical current. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it, it deserves to be discussed fairly. It's interesting in my country, you can go into almost any bookshop and the, the shelves are groaning with the works of uh, Richard Dawkins, denouncing the, uh, the, 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 the terrible people uh, who think that just maybe possibly the, uh, the, the theory of evolution may have some faults. You cannot find, try as you may, a single book which can give you any idea of what it is that Professor Dawkins is attacking. It's not allowed. No publisher will publish it. No bookshop will stock it. It seems to me it's an interesting thing to be discussed. I have no idea how the realm of nature took its present shape. Nor has he, nor has you. Nor have you. Nobody has. We don't know. It's, it's something which is, which, is, which is open to discussion. As a skeptical current, it's interesting. And I think it's one of the other things which is fascinating is the way in which the, the uh, what, what, what I might call the, uh, the Darwinist lobby exalts currently over the recent court case uh, in which it managed to suppress uh, any teaching of the existence of the theory of intelligent design. Now, the case which the Darwinists used to exalt over, quite rightly, was the Scopes case, so ably misrepresented in the film Inherit the Wind, uh, in which it was the boneheaded, literal, Bible literalist creationists who were attempting to suppress the teaching of Darwinism. And the evolutionists quite rightly defeated that in court and exalted over it. Now they're exalting over the suppression of what somebody else wants to say. That seems to me to be a strange transformation and a very telling one. And it is the intolerance and rage of the Darwinists against any expression of skepticism, however cautious, scientifically based and well qualified, which actually makes me wonder whether the ID people may not have a point. Well. I mean, there's the, there's the, there is the, I think there is a ghost of a point there, but it's only this ghost, it's following. That, that evolution occurred uh, is conclusively verified by the uh, record of molecular biology and of uh, fossil record. Um, there, isn't, there has never been an article in any peer-reviewed journal, and there never will be, to say to the contrary. However, that's only to say that it, that it did occur. How it occurred is not 
uh, something that's completely consensual. And the Darwinian theory of natural selection is only so far the uh, least contested of those explanations. And Stephen Jay Gould, for example, of whom I was uh, something of a friend and a great admirer, and Richard Dawkins, who's also a friend of mine, had a tremendous disagreement, still do, posthumous in the case of now, about punctuated evolution, about the steps by which this occurred. But that it occurred is not to be doubted. And thus, the, the idea that there can be equal time for the op opposite theory in a science class is as false as to say, well, children, the chemistry period is over now. After the break, we'll be doing our alchemy uh, class. <laughs> or um, your astronomy teacher is off today, but your astrology uh, alternate uh, can uh, check in. Nonsense. And when, and when President Bush says we should teach the argument, I'm with him, if he's sincere, because everything I know about the, the Darwin argument comes from two great set piece debates. One in Oxford in the late Victorian epoch between Bishop Wilberforce and Thomas Huxley, the inventor of the term agnostic about Darwinism, and the second in Tennessee um, in the in 1920s, uh, even more famous. But if the president wants that and he wants his faith-based initiative, then every church that gets a subsidy or a grant must also teach Darwinism. <laughs> Equal time. Is that what the president wants? I am sure I know the answer to that. Thank you. Let's you're take, a, you're take a fine American, question. Christopher. I'm up here. I missed that. We need the microphone upstairs, please. Try it again, sir. Please do. I'm sorry, I did not hear that. You know, <laughs> well, was, that, was, that was audible to everybody, wasn't it? You first. I, 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 I really couldn't hear it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm well, sorry. I'll tell you. You said, pain. what about subjective experience? If someone says, I had a religious experience, and I went on to do a noble action, shouldn't we credit that to religion? Would that be a fair praise of your question, sir? He says yes. <laughs> I have an answer, but I'm sure you do too. Uh, I suppose so. I, I, it doesn't seem to present any difficulties to my position, so I think I'll hand it over to him. Well, I mean, the be one of the best books for the unbeliever to read is, um, is William James's uh, Varieties of Religious Experience, where, which is, by the way, is a, a trope you come up against a lot with C.S. Lewis, many other religious writers. They say, you who believe in the material world and don't believe in the supernatural, you can't account for the, the experiences of revelation and um, enlightenment and uh, miracles that other people experience. And you, you don't understand the numinous in other words. And I, I say that that's true for me. I don't. Um, and I don't trust them. Um, though I do think they can be confused with experiences of uh, nature, um, landscape, music, sex and love, the numinous in other ways. But if these experiences, the positive ones, are going to be credited to the religion account, then so must the person who says that God told him to go and get a gun and kill all the unveiled girls in the Netherlands. They, if, they're going to be, if, they, if all these things are going to be charged, they've all got to be charged. And that would leave us exactly where the argument from design leaves us, and all the others knew where we started. Sava? I don't... If I could just respond very briefly to that, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of time is wasted in this argument by uh, atheists blaming Christians for all the horrors and oppressions that have taken place in history, and Christians returning, oh no, it was only done by atheists. It's quite plain 
that human beings are always capable of enormous wickedness. And the yes. misunderstanding and misapprehension of religion is, is incredibly dangerous. And I think that the, the idea that either side is faultless in this is absurd and indefensible. But I would very strongly argue that far more good has been done by religious belief than harm. And that great harm is likely to be done to our civilization by an abandonment of religious belief. Sir, our next question. Hi. I was just at a uh, philosophical luncheon at the University of Chicago where they teach your brand of atheism and morality in their theology school. But they were congratulating Chicago Alderman on his life. And one of the things that they cheered was that he had spent several months with Trotsky in Mexico in 1928. They thought this was really great. And that a group of atheists would cheer a man who killed between 40 and 60 million people and having spent, I would now do it, having, and having spent months with him. And this is something they look up to. And this is the top of the people who do this. The Chinese who were atheists killed, what, 100 to 200 million people? They did 90 million people in one, locking up two provinces in the north, and they preached atheism. And Trotsky went and preached atheism across Russia, and then he hung priests from the back of the train. This, to, to say that atheist, atheism will kill without any limit if it, gets, if it gets into power anywhere. This has been proved from one end of the world to another. After Ethiopia, wait, this is this is this is your sir, thing. Atheism will kill. There is no defense. Sir, we need a excuse me, the sir. We, is, sir, we need a question, please. Question no, no, is, he's, got a, he's got a made a perfectly good question. It's how can you defend atheism? I mean, you know, how can there be, you say yeah. that atheism won't kill? I mean, if you bring atheism back right. in a government, it will kill no, as no. many people. No, he's, the question. Of, by the way, I thought it was a perfectly well phrased question. Um, to be an atheist doesn't guarantee you against being a sadist or a nihilist or a fascist or a Stalinist or a Maoist, though it's slightly unlikely I think you'd be a fascist or a national socialist, but it's, it's I would say, a, a necessary condition for enlightenment, not a sufficient one. Um, and I'll take your question seriously in the following way. Um, the 20th century totalitarianisms that are accused of being secular, I'll say something about each of them. It was a long question, so I hope you'll allow me. I'll, I'll try and condense it. Um, to start with the, the original 20th century totalitarian ideology, which originally called itself fascism. If in any account you read of fascism, historical account you read, from its origins in Italy, uh, through Spain, Portugal, Croatia, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, etc. If you take out the word fascist and put Catholic right wing, it's the same story. There's no difference. And if you add with parties in political alliance with the Vatican, it's the same. All of them. Fascism is another word for the Christian Catholic right wing. In, in Slovakia, the actual head of the fascist dictatorship was a priest, Father Tizo. In almost every case, the regime was in holy orders and or with the direct alliance with um, with the, the Pope himself. That's a simple matter. Anyone can check it out. I'm not going to assert it now. I would just say uh, fact-checking and I would be as one on this point. Now, that's not completely true of national socialism. It's true of the Nazi party in Austria and Bavaria in its heartlands that it begins blessed by the Vatican, by a concordat with the church, by the Protestant churches also. But it's not true to say it's a Christian movement quite the same way. It's a pagan movement in, to some extent. Um, my favorite example is this, I suppose. Uh, Joseph Goebbels was expelled from the Catholic Church. He was. He was the only Nazi who was. Why was he expelled? For marrying a divorced Protestant. <laughs> Magda Goebbels. You see, the church does have its standards. <laughs> However, no uh, it is estimated by Paul Johnson, Catholic historian, that f more than 40% of the Waffen-SS were practicing confessing Catholics. No one was ever excommunicated or threatened with excommunication for taking part in the final decision. And that was because of the alliance between the Nazi party and the church on two main things, anti-Bolshevism and anti-Semitism. 
Again, I'm condensing a bit. Now, it brings me to the Stalinists. Okay, you're Joseph Stalin. You've taken over Russia. You've been educated in a seminary in Georgia, by the way. Up till 1917, for hundreds of years, hundreds of millions of Russians have been told that the head of the state is a god. That the Tsar is above power, ordinary secular power, that he's, and he's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church as well as the... You shouldn't be in the dictatorship business if you can't take advantage of a well, a deep well of credulity and servility like that. It's your golden opportunity. What does he do? Heresy trials. Heresy trials, witch hunts. Miraculous discoveries such as Lysenko's biology. The worship of the leader from whom all blessings flow. As I described North Korea, the most religious state I've ever seen. Um, mutatis mutandis, this would apply also to Mao's China with the same background of superstition and servility. Now, for there to be a fair test about this, you'd have to do the following. And no one I've ever debated with has even tried it. So you be the first. You find me a state or a society that threw off theocracy and threw off religion and said, we adopt the teachings of Lucretius and Democritus and Galileo and Spinoza and Darwin and Russell and Jefferson and Thomas Paine. And we make those what we teach our children. We make that scientific and rational humanism our teaching. And you find me the state that did that and fell into tyranny and slavery and famine and torture. And then we'll be on a level playing field. As it is, all you've done is show that the idea of worship and the idea of credulity and the idea of servility and slavery to religion is a bad idea in the first place. But none of the czars and none of the Chinese kings, none of the, none By the of way, the Russian, the Russian Orthodox Church always stayed with Stalin, always stayed with Stalin. But they never killed 30% of their population. Who didn't? The Russians never killed 30% of the population before the communists took over, 20 or 30%. No czar ever did that. No, no Christian czar ever did any killing on it. Well, no, excuse me. They started the First World War. They started the pogroms. They brought the protocols of the elders of Zion to, that was imported by czarist secret policemen to national socialist uh, Christian gangsters in Europe. How much do you think the export of Russian Orthodox anti-Semitism cost us in point of lives and war? And have you ever counted up what happened to uh, the wars uh, in the wars that Tsarism started and carried on? And the persecutions and the famines and the tortures and the starvation and the people who just died of neglect? Come on. You want to do this accounting? I'm here. I'm really here for you. <laughs> or, what the Serbian, or what the Serbian Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox have just done in the Balkans? The, this, the most recent genocide we've seen in Europe, entirely done by, by a Russian and a Serbian Orthodox fascist and Catholic uh, Croatian Ustasha, grinding a whole part of civilized Europe into nothingness and bloodshed for their filthy, stupid medieval quarrels. How dare you say that any secularist, we who've opposed this kind of barbaric stuff, are on all fours with these creeps? Don't, you should take it back. You owe me an apology. You lose, Boychik. You lose, Boychik. Please. Hey, civility. Civility. Civility is overrated. <laughs> not here, it's not. Peter. Right. I think I just conceded the point that you could attribute evil acts to both religious and non religious people, and I continue to concede it. But I think that the answer that you've just heard was shocking in its evasiveness. First of all, the most enlightened government that humanity had ever seen in terms of its own self-conceit, which of course is something that atheists are very fond of, was that of the French Revolutionary Terror, which ended by executing so many people that what is now the Place de la Concorde was ankle deep in blood and the executioners were too tired and disgusted to continue with their work. As for the Soviet Union, 
in which I lived for two and a half years of my life, to portray the ideology and regime of that country as religious is an absurdity almost beyond belief, requiring actually the most colossal nerve to make. This was a state which tried to murder God. It was a state of massacred priests, of desecrated and demolished churches, in which people were brought up with enormous energy not to believe in God. Oh, there was no establishment of religion there, and no tax breaks for, no tax breaks for priests. Nothing of that kind. A total totalitarian horror of persecution of something which people believed to their own comfort in times of the greatest trouble and which they had to keep in their hearts privately and especially if they were anything other than the humblest in society and keep secret if they wished to survive without being thrown out of their homes, thrown out of their jobs or having their marriages deliberately destroyed through persecution. That was the state of it. This was not a religious phenomenon. It is straightforwardly untrue to maintain that it was. I have conceded. I have conceded the evils done by my side. Why can't you just simply accept that the Soviet Union was an atheist regime which hated God? Why can't you do that? Because it would be, because it would be false, because the Russian Orthodox Church stood then, as it did with Stalin, as it now increasingly does. Black cowled figures appear next to Vladimir Putin, former, KG, former current KGB thug, tyrannizer of the Ukraine, uh, Georgia and the Baltics, uh, filthy not replacement it. of you're Tsarism, not the filthy point. synthesis you're, you're of Stalinism and Tsarism. The answer. same Russian Orthodoxy is his official nationalist and statist ideology. There was never a moment in Russian history where the powers that be didn't find that church convenient. It may not have been convenient for you as a believer to notice it, but I am obliged to the truth in the matter. Russia was not an atheist state. It wasn't even a secular state. It was a, a pseudo-religious uh, state borrowing from the practice of orthodoxy and trading upon its teachings and its tradition. And I repeat my challenge. You, for this question to be valid at all, must propose and point out a government that adopts, or state or country or nation, that adopts the teachings of, of Spinoza and Einstein and Jefferson and pain and that fell into massacre and tyranny. And you can't do it, and so you have to look for 10th rate substitutes. Well, it's an impossible which, challenge. You know, I, I can find you a regime which Thomas you know, Paine supported, which attempted to execute him as, a, as gratitude for his support, and so can you. The, the, the point is you, you will not accept the simple truth, which is that the Bolshevik regime, from its beginning, persecuted religion with deep and determined violent, murderous hatred, and to maintain that well, this was in some way a religious phenomenon is, no, it's not a is religious an absurdity. To believe it is to, is to, is to reveal a credulity, every, uh, a credulity driven by an unreasoning faith in God. Every, um, every, every uh, modern state uh, has had to go through a period of declericalization of one kind of violence or another. Um, the Cromwellian Revolution, the Henry VIII's dis, uh, dis, uh, dissolution of the monasteries, uh, the wars in Spain, the, uh, the wars in Italy, uh, the French Revolution, which you mentioned, they all have to go through it. It's usually in, in proportion to how vile, how filthy, how cruel, how tyrannical, how greedy, how ghastly was the pre-existing clerical regime on which much of this must be blamed. But you can't say that the, uh, the test of, of humanistic, secular, atheist values has been conducted until you've had that conducted fairly. Hitler's birthday was celebrated from the pulpit by order of the Vatican, by every church in Germany, till the last day of his regime. Do I say that makes you a national socialist? No, I don't. No, I don't. I would know how to if I was capable of a low blow. But as you know, I'm not. Peter, any last response? No, it's, 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 it's obviously futile. Our last it's an question. Invincible faith. In in the last few years, we've witnessed. Um, Speak up. In the last few years, we've witnessed many atrocities perpetrated by fundamentalists, 
and I'm concerned that um, we run the risk of letting our responses fall into a fundamentalist mode of thinking. And I'd like to have each of you comment on that. I'm not sure I got the grammar of, of your question, sir. I must be honest. Well, the, 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 the concern I have is that how can we sustain a, a modern secular response to a medieval fundamentalist atrocities? And, and how can we convince our politicians to take a secular modern approach to uh, thinking about these things and educating the populace about them? Um. There's something slightly faint about the question, I have to say. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to assume I know what you mean by fundamentalist. If we take the best known current political dispute in which this country is involved, I suppose, and the oldest one and the best understood, it would probably be the question of Palestine, okay? where there, have been, there has been for some time a conflict between two nationalisms, approximately equivalent size of peoples, Jewish and Arab. Um, over a piece of land about the size of Wales um, with a great and quite just claims, emotionally just claims on both of their parts going back quite a long time. Um, for a long time now, the solution to this very uh, difficult matter has seemed to many people to be something like a partition, an, an award of roughly half each of the disputed territory not, it's not perfect, it's not great, but it is the, it is the accepted view of, of the PLO now, of most of the Israeli voting public, of the vast majority of American Jews, of the UN, of the European Union, of the international community, and so forth. And it makes a rough kind of sense. It's not brilliant, but it's, it's, it's thinkable. It's not insane. Why can't we get what everyone seems to want? Because of religion. That's why. Because there are enough people on the Jewish side to say, what land split? God gave all this land to us, all of it to us. And on the other side, it doesn't take much to say, you're dead right about that. God did it award all the land, but not to you, to the Muslims only. And there are enough of them to make certain there cannot be a solution. And just as if that wasn't enough, the mad supporters of Judaism and the mad supporters of Islam, the American Christians to the rescue. With luck, with luck, if the Jews can be supported long enough, as our rope supports the hanging man, they can bring on the Battle of Armageddon, the thing we all secretly yearn for, as all religions do. Totalitarian first in their origin, genocidal in their conclusions. We want this to be over. We want this world to pass away. We are pointless without that demand. We are not humanists. We are eschatologists. And hey, what could be more wonderful? The Jews will bring it on, and those who aren't converted in time to Christianity will be turned to ash, as will everybody else. So what could be more heavenly than that? So now you see why religion poisons everything. These congregations, these congregations and their religions and the filthy texts on which they base themselves earnestly desire that everything we call civilization and everyone in this room be destroyed. They want it, they relish it, they work for it while you're asleep, as well as while you're awake. Coexistence with this kind of thing is as impossible as coexistence with fascism or Stalinism. The sooner we wake up to it, the better our chances of survival will be. Thank you, Christopher. It's my unhappy task to have to call the question time to an end now. Uh, thank you very much, Peter and Christopher Hitchens, for a very lively and provocative debate.